So I was hoping to talk to you about an inspiring, hopeful post-pandemic landscape that we find ourselves in. Um, and the truth is I'm sat here pretty disheveled, surrounded by uh, detritus of toys, uneaten snacks uh, and boredom. Two days into isolation as my seven-year-old has tested positive for COVID. So this this is not the face of a slick arts professional. This is the face of, um, I'm, I'm afraid to say, a weary single mum with COVID nipping at her ankles. Uh, this is a, the face of a vulnerable human, tired from the last two years. And I guess it's this very essence of humanity that we work and feel so strongly bonded to, to explore and connect with in the arts. So I'm the programmer of this wonderful little indie venue in Brighton and Hove um, called The Old Market. We are a 500 standing, 300 seated capacity space in the center of the city. We host a diverse array of cross genre arts, performance and installations. And I wanted to chat today a little bit about our trajectory through the last two years and where it has left us. So, in a bizarre apocalyptic atmosphere in March 2020, myself and my colleague Tanya slowly went around our much loved venue and switched off the lights. A building that we were used to seeing and hearing so alive, so full of life and laughter and applause, was completely silent and completely empty. It felt resonant at the time. We didn't know that we were facing, what we were facing. We didn't know when we would be back. And I remember looking at the ghost light on the stage and wondering if and when it would be lit again. Uh, Anne-Marie, could we play the first video, please? So at the beginning of the lockdown, we pined and we feared and we isolated and we wrote countless funding bids to try and keep our heads above water. Arts and culture felt like, I guess, the forgotten piece of a possible therapeutic solution, our road through the pandemic. And we knew it was essential to the mental and emotional health of our country, but we as a venue didn't really know how to support that without being able to bring people together. Uh, could we have the second video, please?
So thankfully, the government eventually granted us a pot of money from the Cultural Recovery Fund. Uh, we, we were one of the lucky ones, and we certainly didn't take it for granted. Uh, we wouldn't be here with the doors still open if we didn't get that money. It was absolutely crucial to us getting through. So we set to work using some of the funding to retrain our staff in filming and vis vision mixing and live streaming. And we started to play with the live stream format and see what we could do differently. We wanted to continue the work we'd started building a program that celebrated kick-ass female artists under our reigning women banner. So we created a trilogy of live streams that celebrated the incredible array of female talent in the city. We had singers, rappers, poets, dancers. Um, whilst we couldn't have audiences physically in the space, we were grateful to be able to invite some brilliant artists to come and do their thing while we cut our teeth on a new format. Could we play the third video, please? Oh my, it was joyous to work on those live streams and to work with some artists in our space again. It was also joyous to explore how we might make our program um, more accessible going forwards to audiences who couldn't physically come to the venue. We were able to connect, to connect with audiences internationally as well as locally. And we were able to learn new skills as a venue and work with young camera ops and production talent. So along with the live streams, we were also able to continue our Tom Tech program. Anne-Marie, could we play the Tom Tech video, please? We launched Tom Tech uh, six years ago in order to better support makers working at the intersection of arts and tech. We wanted to explore how tech can free the narrative potential of a show rather than hinder it. Tom Tech now forms our core thinking about what it is we do as a venue and what we need to do to stay relevant to both our audiences and the next generation. The programme mixes labs, industry training, commissioning and public installations. We feel it's vital that cutting edge tech is accessible to everyone and that there is equality of opportunity in learning what it can do. So during lockdown, with the partnership of the Hera Arts and Wellbeing Consortium, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, we were able to offer our lab program digitally. Under the Hera Partnership aims, we wanted to continue the work we do around training artists to use new kit, but with a particular focus on accessibility, tackling inequality of opportunity, mentorship, connection and community, and health and wellbeing. Amongst other online courses, we trained artists in how to use light form projectors. Now, light form units are um, a device that auto scans the environment to create a high resolution mesh. And that mesh is easily layered with visuals and effects to create an augmented reality mapped video. These units enable us to projection map on a much smaller, less expensive scale. So we offered open call micro commissions adapted with consultation from our HERA partners, diversity and ability to be accessible to low confidence and neurodivergent artists. 82% of our lab trainees were female and non-binary. 50% were from low income households and 50% were neurodivergent or had a physical disability. As this pandemic has only proved technology is inordinately powerful. And as long as opportunities for access lie with the rich and powerful, we are never going to change that dynamic. So big tech has compounded our sense of isolation 
and has been so divisive in so many ways during the last two years. But the project ideas coming out of these labs were essentially about human connection. How to tour visual memories to libraries and care homes. How to connect and reach people on the streets with exciting street projections during lockdown when people were isolated. This tech had the potential to connect us. And that's where I see our role as a venue going forwards. Humans are resilient and we are adaptable, but we aren't adapted to fighting crisis for two years. Mental health, isolation, grief, there is no one that this pandemic hasn't touched. Community, belonging, health and well-being are our urgent priorities now. We are neurologically hardwired to be in connection with each other. And I see venues like us as the connective tissue of our society. We're a place to celebrate the human condition. The HERA partnership I mentioned before is a five year plan supported by the council to push a cohesive citywide health and wellbeing strategy. To provide social prescribing opportunities, creative and therapeutic workshops in collaboration with GP practices to support our healthcare system. Our role is not just to put on shows, our role going forwards is to provide a system for recovery. A recent show we worked on as part of the HERA project was a beautiful dance show from a company called 201 Dance. Their show was based on Michael Rosen's SAB book and the book described how Michael felt after the tragic loss of his son to meningitis. We invited some of the service users to see the show quite recently. Uh, and then to take part in some creative workshops supported by therapists and healthcare practitioners. One of the comments uh, that we actually received only, only yesterday after the workshops was this. Thank you for the workshop. I thought it would be useful for me, but I never expected to stumble across what might well turn out to be the long lost key to unlocking the grief process in my soul. That's why we work in the arts, and this is where the arts can help us to recover. <laughs>